Hello, and welcome to episode one of the Western Outdoor News Podcast. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Brad Van Zyl, and I love the outdoors. I've always loved reading Western Outdoor News every week. I read it to keep up to date with the hunting world and the fishing world. So I love it so much I approached Western Outdoor News because I wanted to create an audio version of what you might be reading every week in the newspaper or at woenews.com. So you've read the articles, but it's rare to have a conversation with the writers or the contributors and some of the icons that we have in the industry here. So that's what you can expect from this show. I hope you subscribe to it and you follow along with me as we talk to tons of people across the entire industry and learn more about this hobby that we all love so much. So what's in store for the first episode? Uh, Let's see. So we have a quick conversation with Fred Clinshaw, and we talked to him about his recent article that was in Western Outdoor News titled Tackling Cold Water, A Mental Approach to Winter Bassin. Uh, That's a really quick 10-minute conversation. You're going to learn a lot, especially about Lake Casitas. Later on in the show, we have a conversation with Tracy Ehrenberg, and we learn how her and her husband transformed the sport fishing industry in Cabo with Pisces sport fishing. If you've ever been to Cabo, I'm sure you've heard of Pisces. Her story is absolutely incredible, and I can't wait for everybody to hear it. But first, let's jump to Fred Clinshaw and talk about his mental approach to fishing freshwater bass in the winter. Yeah, thank you, Brad. My name is Fred Clinshaw, and I'm a fishing guide uh, specifically targeting bass at Lake Casitas, uh, Lake Castaic, and now Lake Kachuma. And uh, you, I could be reached at, uh, well, it, it, the easiest way is just find me hashtag Fred Clinshaw Fishing, or you can go to my website, www.fredclinshawfishing.com. Or if you're on Instagram, check out the Hammer of Fury. And uh, you could also search my name, Fred Clinshaw, there as well. Awesome. All right. So we'll keep a, yeah. keep an eye out for you, Fred. But uh, we Thank wanted you. to we wanted to catch up. We saw an article in the recent issue of Western Outdoor News. It was called "Tackling Cold Water: A Mental Approach to Winter Bassin." So we're kind of in the thick of it here in the Southern California winter, if you want to call it that. Uh, you know, being in Southern California, I saw that. <laughs> Uh, Casitas was creeping up into the 80s next week so yeah pretty Mm -hmm. brutal winter down here but uh (laughs) oh gosh yeah I mean we actually had to put pants on I think last couple weeks it's uh incredibly cold (laughs) yeah Um, it's it's horrible the high socks get have to come out (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) so um as far as tactics go um you know as if anybody who knows Casitas it doesn't really pattern well it's it's a day to day fishing so it could it's one of the most challenging lakes i've fished in southern california but um the tactics right now is you're well we're going back to that the temperature at casitas can jump up to five degrees a day depending on the, the you know if we got a santa Ana winds or hey you know the cloud cover or whatnot um one of the things to do when you're fishing casitas and it's cold and you're you're looking for right now you're looking at a probably about 58 to 55 degree water mm-hmm. um typically when the water gets below 55 is when the lake turns over into full winter mode so with that said right now we're probably at about 56 57 degree so you got some of the bass that are in their what I would call typical winter pattern, Um, even though I said that it doesn't pattern well, but what I mean by that is you're going to find them deep. You're going to find them in structure. You're going to find them deeper and do your normal jig, you know, uh, shaky head, Carolina rig type stuff. But don't discount some of the shallow water approach too. There's, uh, There's some fish coming up because this is the time when we start doing trout plants up at the lake. And uh, that will typically bring fish out of those deep water um, and feeding on trout or coming up close to close to the bank, and, you know, ambush points waiting for them. Yeah. So yeah, so what is, and what's well, what is your stance on throwing those big swim baits in the in the winter like this? I love it. You know, um, what what happens in the water is uh, at, at Casitas and Castaic as well is. 
this is the time of the year when the water gets cool. It gets a little more, I don't know if it's the right word, but sterile. So it gets clear. It mm -hmm. gets very clear. So you can, you can draw a fish from deeper water with even like a floating type swim bait, you know, it's been yeah. done a million times. I mean, you can meter fish in 30, 40 feet, throw a swim bait that is sub maybe just a few feet and draw fish from that depth because they're keyed in on that. And that's what they're eating. Uh, especially when we're getting plants heavily. Um, we haven't had a lot of heavy plants, uh, but when we, when we do get them, you might expect a few days of swim bait fishing. And, awesome. Yeah. I know and, a lot of people yeah. look forward to that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. So you did mention about, uh, you know, in this cold, this cold water, cold winter, uh, these months, you're looking for a darker bottom versus like a lighter sand. Are you finding a lot of that out there? And are you seeing a lot of success with that? If you're metering around yeah. and you're looking for, for that darker bottom to radiate more of the heat? Yeah. So getting back to that clearer water, that's what you'll, you'll find is um, when you have a situation where you might have a cove on a certain part of the lake that is clearer. Well, that darker bottom, of uh, that darker bottom. Uh, well, obviously it'll attract more heat. So you might find some, some fish in that area and they'll gravitate towards that bottom because that's where the heat's coming from. You know, you're getting some, some, uh, some of that uh, sunshine UV through the water column to the bottom attracting that heat just like if you were wearing a black t-shirt on a cold day you would you would be warmer than if you were wearing a white t-shirt you know absolutely yeah. yeah and so you'll get fish laying on the bottom there and those are some areas that i may target um also um some rockier areas or some areas with a little bit of cover like such as like some some trees and and whatnot you know okay. just areas like that yeah mm -hmm. All right. So, so what's kind of the current situation at Casitas and when's kind of the last time you went out and, and what did you see out there on the water? Well, I fished quite a bit and um, it's, I, this week, <laughs> this week is a week I'm getting my boats recarpeted. So I haven't been out, but I'll be <laughs> out tomorrow. And this is a, this is kind of a perfect segue to this article because I'm going to go out there tomorrow. have not fished in four days and I'm going to have to decide where I'm going to start and what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to probably hit some of the areas we've already spoke of. Some of these areas, these flats that might be in a little bit deeper that might have some deep water uh, nearby so that I can quickly figure out what's going on. I can meter and see if there's some suspended fish in the area. They're laying on the bottom or and I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe start like on a flat that's 30 feet that goes deep quickly so I can meter as fast as I can and try to find the fish as quickly as possible so that I could be more successful throughout the day versus spending all day to try to find a couple fish. Yeah. That's, what, just that's kinda, what I was wondering about that. Mm -hmm. How, how long do you spend on a spot in the winter? Do you, are you trying to throw a thousand casts in the same area or are you, are you just trying to find those fish and metering around all day? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's, um, that, that's a really good question because if I know they're there, I'll sit all day. <laughs> and, um, yeah, especially like a, a winter tournament, you're looking for five bites and you know the fish are there. Um, yeah. I may sit in that area instead of hunting around for them. But if I were, say, only going to fish a couple days this month, I would probably start in an area that I like to start 30 feet. 30 feet's good. 30 feet's good year-round anyway. You know, you can go... You can cast shallower, you can cast deeper, it's depending on the spot you're at. You can, you can be in 30 feet and you could have your lure land in 10, or you can have your lure land in 50, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. depending on the spot you're at, it's a good way to kind of gauge, especially if you don't have a meter, you know you're fishing a lot of the different water columns uh, by doing that. Um, but yeah, 30 feet's about where I look, maybe some long flat, maybe uh, with a point nearby where I can go deep real quick, shallow real quick, kind of hunt around and kind of section off the puzzle a little bit and find where they're at. Okay. All right. So yeah. just mm -hmm. always out there trying to, to put the puzzle pieces together and get that yeah. bite in the summer. When, yeah. What time of year are you looking forward to the most right now? 
I want the lake to be turned over. I, I, I like when all the fish are kind of in the same area. Um, it makes it a little tough in the winter when you could still have fish up shallow or suspended, maybe even on the surface and, or on the bottom. But when it's cold and the lake's finally turned over and all the fish are kind of gravitating towards maybe, let's just give an example, like 40 feet in the rocks. Mm -hmm. So you just go fish 40 feet and find them in the rocks, you know, I mean, you, uh, and, and there, you, a lot of us have a lot of places like that, just areas we're very comfortable in, in the winter time. Um, but like every year is different. Sometimes there's a shallow bite in the winter. Sometimes there's a, you know, very deep, I've gotten them all the way to 70 feet at times, you know, with the jig wow. and then, yeah. And then also there's been times in the winter, the middle of January, um, pre-spawn uh way pre-spawn where you know we're catching them in 12 feet of water um so yeah it, <laughs> it, that, that's what makes us so crazy as bass fishermen we you know there's a, you just when you think you figured it out in the next year um, it, it's not the same <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah. But, all right uh, yeah so, i think so, typically oh i'm sorry yeah but no go ahead i this, cut you off yeah sure yeah typically this time of the year you can't go wrong with a ground game and a lot of fish are hiding, you know, they're, they're probably stacked up around structure, you know, hard structure, like a tree or no, no weeds, but like a tree or, uh, or some rocks or something like that. Yeah. And any, any bait that you can leave down there and move without moving it far, like a jig or maybe even a drop shot or something and just leave it for them to decide whether they want to eat it, not a fast moving bait. And every client, pretty much every client that I've ever fished with has probably heard me say the term for lack of better judgment of being politically correct. I say the fat kid never chases the ice cream truck. <laughs> you know? So, you know, yeah. So you basically you have to let the bait sit down there and let them see it yeah. and let, let them come to you instead of you trying to throw out a reaction bait right now. 100%. If you're confident the fish are there, leave it there for them. Maybe work the fish that are in the area or some that might be moving to that area where they're going to be more comfortable. You know, they might have moved off, looked somewhere else, but they're going to come back and kind of bed down or hang out, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's that's kind of my winter approach, you know. And Perfect. But you always have to be willing to adapt, you know. I mean, if, okay, so I said 30 feet's a good place, but what if you find them in that 12 feet of water? Or what if you have to go all the way to 60 feet for them? I mean, you just have to keep your mind open for that kind of stuff. I'd like to thank Fred Clinshaw for calling in and being such a good sport about that. And hopefully you guys have a good idea for some, uh, some winter bass and techniques. So we have a pretty cool feature here on the show. It is going to be a voice mailbox. So what happens is you call this number and you can leave a message for up to three minutes. And it can be questions, comments, a trip report, anything that you'd like to say. And we could feature it on the show, but be nice, be nice. Uh, our voicemail number is 702 8504966. It doesn't even ring. You just leave a message after the beep and you will go into our voicemail box for a chance to be featured on the show. So for our next segment, I sat down with Tracy Ehrenberg to talk about the rise of Pisces sport fishing and how she got started transforming the sport fishing world in Cabo San Lucas. I'm originally from Brighton in England. That's a little seaside town, so I've always lived near the sea. Um, and that's where I grew up, or was dragged up, whichever way you'd like to look at it. Um, very turbulent childhood. Uh, I was already living on my own by the time I was 15 years old and supporting myself. Mm -hmm. So I had a full-time job, plus an evening job, plus I was taking a free class at the local college to learn how to type and to do shorthand. I don't know if people even know what shorthand is these days, right? It's a special like code that you'd write in. Uh -huh. Anyway, so I was working in the West End of London when I was about 18 years old. And any job I would go for, I would get because I could talk my way into it. I don't know why. I, God bless me with just being confident. And anything they said, can you do? I'd say, oh, yeah, I can do that. And I would run to the library. Remember, there was no internet back then. 
and quickly read about it and learn it and go back and say, sure, no problem, I can do that. So I took myself into all kinds of jobs. And then I ended up at a job for a development company in the West End of London. And one day, um, one of the directors came in and said, hey, we have a job coming up in the Canary Islands. Would you like to go? I'm like, it's winter, it's England, it's cold. And I'd remember walking home a few days before saying, I'm never going to be cold again in my life. <laughs> so they said, I said, yeah, I'm interested. I foolishly did not ask what the job was, what it paid, or how I was going to get there. I just said, yeah, I'll take it. Get you out of here. And they said, here's a ticket. You leave next week. (laughs) So I bought a plane. I didn't even ask who was supposed to pick me up or what the contact's name was. I did not want to appear naive. Mm -hmm. So I show up in the Canary Islands. Yeah. And um, I like looking around. There's a lot of dodgy people in mirrored sunglasses. I'm like, oh, no, maybe they've sold me into the white slave trade. (laughs) (laughs) Anyhow, some lovely yeah. Americans came to meet me, a man from Boca Raton, Florida, and he was my boss. His name was Bob Trotter, and they were doing a uh, development, a timeshare development, the first in Europe, and I was like his personal assistant. Mm-hmm. He did tell me he was a little nervous when I walked in with a book under my arm that said, teach yourself how to type, but we got on fantastic after that. Oh, so good. I found myself living in the Canary Islands um, in a whole new environment, and uh I went back home to England for a quick visit. Um, I had a fiancé at the time, but we broke up. And I told him, you will regret this for the rest of your life. Mm. And turned on my heel and left. And I met Marco two days later. Wow. Uh, And Marco is from Mexico City. He's my husband of 37 years. And um, I met him at the gym. And he asked me out. I said yes. And he proposed five days later. Five days. And the rest is history. Wow. Wow. So that's my story. That gets us as far as out of the Canary Islands. He came in one day to my office and said, hey, I'd like to go back to my own country and work. Will you come with me? I said, yes. I didn't think things through very much. You know, you're kind of dumb when you're young. You don't ask the right questions. And it was a lot safer world back then. Yeah. So um, I got on a plane with Marco and arrived in Cabo San Lucas in 1984. Wow. When there was one paved road, no traffic lights. I didn't speak Spanish. I didn't know how to drive a car. And I had not even the remotest conception of Mexico. Mm -hmm. When you are in the United States, it's your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So you're very familiar. You visit. I had no conception. I thought it would be like Roadrunner cartoons. (laughs) You know, very, very naive. Yeah. So we came here to Cabo San Lucas. And the reason we came was Marco's father and brother and himself loved fishing. And even though his father was in the steel business in Mexico City, they would often visit Baja for the fishing. And they loved it so much that they commissioned the building of three 28-foot boats to be built in La Paz. And the boats were being run by Marco's brother. And then the brother lost interest and moved to mainland Mexico. They had them with the manager. So we said, let's move the boats to Cabo San Lucas. They went first to the East Cape and then to Cabo with the manager. And then we came over and, and took over the business. Mm-hmm. So if you'd said to me all those years ago, what's a marlin? I would have had no clue. Animal, vegetable, mineral, give me a category. (laughs) So we arrived here and um, took over what was then the Pisces fleet, three 28-foot boats, and two of those boats are still in service today. No way. Wow. So was that the... Actually, the Adriana, the one that took the Wahoo prize yesterday is one of those boats well congratulations that's uh that's going to get that team uh quite a bit of money just off that that's called good maintenance yeah um so yeah i showed up here and that was so that was the whole fishing industry in cabo at that time was was it just those three boats were there oh no no there were probably about five or six fleets back then but there was um no infrastructure there were no docks the marina was already cut out, but there was no docks. There was not one building that you see around this marina that even existed. There was the Hotel Finisterra and the Hotel Hacienda. And they just the recently built Hotel San Mar. So three, three hotels. Um, so how many people could even, if they were completely sold out, how many people could fit in the town back then in Cabo? Well, the population of Cabo back then was about 3,000 people. Mm-hmm. And they you probably had about maybe... 200 rooms. Wow. (laughs) Quite different compared to the number of rooms that we're looking out on today. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So we had we started with three boats. So mm-hmm. take us from three boats to where we are today. A little over forty boats. Yeah, <laughs> over forty boats. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure a lot has happened between three and forty. Uh, yeah. So what? Uh, so what? How did we grow from there? Well, so we came and we started doing, you know, the fishing business, and we're all about giving service. That's what gives us satisfaction. Of course, you have to make money. Mm-hmm. But we're invested in long-term relationships with our clients. We're not just here to make a quick buck and disappear. Uh, we're also invested in the community, into conservation. Back then, we weren't. I mean, it would be very common to see 14, 15 dead marlin all lined up on the dock, you know? Yeah. So then we started thinking about this and realizing that, you know, how is this even sustainable? Mm-hmm. And we began um, encouraging people to release their billfish, and we would give them a little replica marlin and a certificate. And Marco was actually the innovator. We, we had, he had a few run-ins because he, even though Marco's from Mexico City, he's blonde and blue-eyed, <laughs> and everybody thinks he's a gringo, but he's not. He's totally Mexican. And um, so, like, he'd go down on the dock, and people would see all these innovations that he was making, and they would call immigration on him. And he, oh, no. and he'd like come and he'd know them. Hey, guys, you know, yeah. he'd speak to them in Spanish. And yeah. he did come up with these booths that they now all use around the dock. That was he was the forerunner of that. We had like a little stand. Or people, or you could take care of the people in the morning. Okay. So um, the fleet started to grow a little bit. Marco was really good at a lot of things, and I was very good at administration. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it came to a head when he said, you know, we didn't charge those people. They've been fishing six days, and they've left to the airport. I think they're wearing a red T-shirt. Let's go look for them, you know? Wow. So I said, okay, I'll take over, like this kind <laughs> so, of stuff. Yeah. And so I um, learned a lot about fishing. It was, it was kind of tough, you know, because I'm a foreign woman. I did not speak the language, mm-hmm. and I'm in a very macho world. So it took several years for me to um, learn about the boats. I knew nothing, you know. Mm-hmm. I would try and communicate with the mechanic and, like, sign language, <laughs> but I learned. Yeah. So um, it took a while for the crews to learn to respect me too, mm-hmm. you know. So that's taken years to build. A lot of extra extra hurdles that you had to jump over just yeah. to get everything started. Yeah. And especially starting something from essentially scratch and mm-hmm. building it into this with all those But, but you know, we started with the fleet, and then from there, you know, we opened a boutique, and there was a lady that um, came once from Pedagon. and said, hey, if you ever know anybody that wants to buy a condo, here's my card. Give me my card. So some guys came in. I said, oh, that lady got some condos. She came back two weeks later and gave us $3,000. Mm-hmm. And we were like, What? <laughs> we would have to send the boats out 10 times to come anywhere near making that kind of money. So then Marco diversified a little bit and went into real estate. And I continued with the fleet. And then I saw the needs for more boats because we were really on it with the service and taking care of everything, you know, for laying and freezing the people's fish, all kinds of stuff that we did, you know, speaking good English, getting back to them on time, good equipment, not skimping, crews. I mean, our crews today, some of them have never worked anywhere else. So in a way, we all grow up together, you know. So now we're starting to see the next generation, the sons and the nephews coming up through the ranks. So is that how it works? I wanted to ask you, you've had a lot of captains, a lot of uh, a lot of crewmates throughout the years. So what do you look for in these crew members? Um, they need to be honest, number one. Mm-hmm. Honest, hardworking, friendly, a level of English. The fishing skill comes with time, loyalty. But, you know, we take care of our people. They make us who we are. They're the reason for our success. Mm-hmm. So they do tend to stand up, you know, to stay a very long time with us. And if they have opportunities where they can better themselves, then, we, you know, they go with our blessing. Mm-hmm. But it seems like we end up finding them jobs on bigger boats or selling boats to clients, and then they end back up in the fleet. Oh, okay. So fishing skill, yes. Mm-hmm. They have to be able to take care of their boat very well. Got to be safe. Some English. And they have to have a passion for fishing more than anything else. Of course. So what do you see with the changeover into this, the next generation? I'm sure you've seen uh, a lot of people come and go. So what are you seeing with the new generation of, of anglers? Here? Not just the anglers, but the clients. Because in the old days, you just have old Pepe as the captain. You didn't really care if you spoke much English or spoke to you. Today, everybody wants to be entertained. Mm-hmm. So they really have to up their skill set, you know? Mm-hmm. So some of the captains will make fresh ceviche on board or make a fresh sashimi on board. They have to speak better English. They have to be good with the camera, okay? Mm -hmm. Because social media is like, seems to be everything these days. So the boats that get rented are the ones that have good social media. So if you have a good deckhand that's filming, that's taking videos, that's, you know, really interactive with the clients, 
you're going to get more business and the whole thing's going to be perpetuated throughout the whole social media platform. So mm -hmm. that's the different skill set. Plus, um, we're seeing a big influx of anglers from all over the world now in different crews. So we see crews coming from Costa Rica, from Florida, um, all over the world, and they're bringing their fishing techniques to Cabo. Mm -hmm. Because Cabo is really one of the only fisheries where they cast live bait to marlin, you know, yeah. for striped marlin. We see them up on the surface. They're really good at mm -hmm. casting. It's not a drop back. They see it and they cast the bait and they can smack the marlin right on the bill with them, you know. So that, and this is one of the only few places in the world for a very short season, like a week, maybe one to three weeks, will be bottom fish for marlin too. There's a time of year when they're on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, they have to have a strong skill set. Now we're using the balloons and kites and yeah. all this kind of stuff and spectra and fluorocarbon and all these things that no one had any clue about mm -hmm. back in the day. So is, are those some of the biggest innova innovations that you've seen throughout the years? Or has there been any innovation that's come and gone that everybody everybody jumped on that, that trend, jumped on that boat when it happened, and then kind of went by the wayside? Were there any, no, anything no, no, no I don't on? think there's anything that's really gone by the, uh, by the wayside. There used to be something called the Solina Tables. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're still around. This Never was a little been. book, and it would tell you, according to the uh, tides and the sun and the moon, when was going to be the best time for the bite. Oh. Right? So mm. people used to use those. Um, and then they use something called terrafin or ROFs, which gives you the water temperatures. That became very popular when people didn't have such sophisticated electronics on their boats. Mm -hmm. So what I see is being lost a little bit are the old skills of knowing where you are. These days, everybody has a GPS. Mm -hmm. In those days, you would line up this mountain with that mountain, and that's where the fish were. So visual fishing uh, it's always been huge here in Cabo, you know, the birds looking for sudden colors, temperature breaks. So, yeah, I would say um, a lot more electronics are being used. But when it comes down to it, it's still about having that feeling and having the eyes. Eyes on the water is still the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And you definitely, <laughs> with 40 boats, you definitely have a lot of eyes on the water. Is there a lot of communication between all of your boats? Yeah, and, they're, all, yeah. They're, all in the same, they're all in the same place. Let me explain to you a little bit about the boats. So we have what we call our standard cruisers. Mm -hmm. And these are 28, 31-foot Bertrams, Unifly. The Bertram Hall, I think, is unbeatable, extremely safe. Our boat that is oldest, although you wouldn't look, no, because is a La Brisa. She's a 1962. Wow. And she fishes over 200 days a year. A boat is as good as the maintenance. Mm -hmm. So if the hull is good... Well, you know, we take like one boat out a year, we strip them down to the home, we rebuild them, you know, new engines if necessary. We have our own yard, so we do all our own work. Okay. We rebuild the boats, we have a fiberglass guy, we have electricians, mechanics, painters, we just, you know, rebuild our home. That's part of our success, is that we can supply our own maintenance. So the second those boats pull in, there's a crew there ready to fix anything that's gone on, you yeah. know, during the day. So that's our standard boats, and then um, we found people asking for faster newer, more creature comforts like air conditioning, you know, some of the ladies would like to be that not the hardcore fisherwoman. And we started um, making alliances with boat owners who were perhaps a private boat owner, mm -hmm. but who wanted the, to um, offset their cost of owning a boat by chartering it a little. Okay. They do that legally with us and uh, we get them all the correct paperwork. We train the crews, they have the insurance and everything. So more and more boats have wanted to be added to the fleet because boats can't sit. If an owner's not going to be using them, those boats need to move. keeps the crews on their toes. Mm -hmm. They can make a little extra money on tips. And, um, you know, the boat gets used and they can own a boat without it costing them anything or not too much money. And in some cases, they even make a profit. But it's not a great business. But, yeah, you but know, it, it's a good option for owners. Yeah, and it gets more, more boats out on the water and... Uh, more, more eyes on the water for sure for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so we're here at the, the Western Outdoor News Cabo Tuna Jackpot. So what does the tournament look like from you from this perspective? I know when, when we came in, it was pretty hectic. We had, uh, we had an injury. We had a lot of messages coming in. What does this tournament look like from your perspective? I love this tournament. This is my favorite tournament of the year. Why? Because it's accessible to anybody. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a multimillionaire. You haven't got to have a fancy boat. Everybody is welcome and everybody is on an even footing. You know, whether you've got an 80 foot Viking yacht that's maybe worth $8 million, or if you've got a panga, it might be worth $5,000. Yeah. 
you're treated the same and you have the same opportunity. Yeah. The advantage the larger boats are, or the modern boats are, is they may be a little bit faster so they can go a little bit further. But I've seen pangas come racing into the scale at the last minute and win the whole tournament. Mm-hmm. And I like the fact of the rules where they only allow one mate. Because the bigger the boat, the more crew, the more odds, you know, of having a successful a fish successfully gaffed and in the boat. Yeah. So this is still the tournament that is for everybody, you know? Mm-hmm. So you mentioned a panga coming in at the very last minute. The Dr. Pescalo with Jaime. <laughs> yeah. He's done this a few times. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I, I've heard the story, I, but I'm sure our listeners would love to hear the story of the, the local anglers on the panga at the last minute. Well, you know, it's always down to the wire, you know. You think you've got the tournament worked out. You think you know who's going to win. Everybody's almost like semi-celebrating, and then somebody else would just come in. And years ago, I don't remember what year it was, probably about 10 years ago now, that's what happened with Jaime, and he's got this, like, kind of beat-up panga, but he's an amazing fisherman. And, um, you know, they're all celebrating a fish on another boat, and here comes Jaime just two seconds before the deadline of, like, you cannot weigh your fish, races up to the dock, and they pull out this huge fish up on the scale, and those guys won. Wow. Won the tournament. So, yeah. I mean, I love the tournament. It's fun. I love the way that it's organized. Um, the boat checkout in the morning, there is nothing like that. Uh, there's a lot of tournaments in Cabo. This is now the biggest and the best year we've ever had in this tournament. We had 211 boats. Wow. Um, and I kind of got involved by accident because I was always, you know, I've always had a great relationship with Western Outdoor News because back in the day, uh, I've been writing the fish report since like 1985. I have all my records going back there and I would always type it up on a computer no, we didn't have a computer on a typewriter back then. <laughs> we had the first fax machine in town, and we thought that was the bee's knees, you know? Oh. And I would fax it off to Western Outdoor News to your reporter, who back then was called Fred Hopter, mm-hmm. and then Gene Kira. And so every week they relied on my fish report, and I would always give the truth and accurate numbers, you know? So that's how we began to develop a rapport. And then the guys were down here. I think it was Joe Higgins, Kit McNear, and Pat McDonald. They said, let's do a tuna tournament. Mm-hmm. And they had somebody that was helping them that bailed out after about two years. And they said, would you help? Okay. So we stepped up. And then we just became a dynamo, all of us as a team. And we grew it like the party boat that we do. We'd Mm -hmm. gone out and done a shotgun start. And they said, let's crank up the music. And we were just dancing on the boat on our own. You're having a great time. I said, people would love to do this. Absolutely. So then we made it into a charity thing and opened it up. And now it's like people love that when we're not in a COVID situation. We'll have two, three hundred people on that boat. Mm -hmm. So. So that's what I like about the tournament. I like that it's fair. There's no shenanigans. I think Pat McDonough, who's retiring this year as tournament director, has been a very, very uh, good tournament director because there's no gray. He's black and white, mm-hmm. and no one argues with him, and he's very fair. Absolutely. So I love the fact that this tournament also, the biggest thing for me is the business it brings to this town, mm-hmm. and I like the fact that all the local charter boats get rented, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, we had a breakdown this morning. We couldn't even find a you know, replacement boat hardly to put somebody on. Wow. So I love the fact of the whole diversity of the boats there. I mean, you saw yourselves out there. You know, you saw pangas. You saw little charter boats. You oh, saw yeah. the big fancy side boats. <laughs> you saw a 130-foot sports fishing yacht. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a great tournament. And I like the two-day format. Yeah, and so it, it does support a lot of the local economy, but especially with the, uh, with the charter boats that are going out. What uh, what are some more specific uh, some specific stories of the local economy here being boosted by uh, the traffic from angling? Well, let me let me just show you this. This is a uh, poster that we produced recently, which shows how many people it takes to put out a charter boat for us on a daily basis. Okay. So this one's in Spanish, but if you have a look, that's what it takes to put out a boat every wow. day. So I'm looking at about. What is this? Six, nine, 12, 12 crew members just to put out a charter boat. And yeah. this, these are the people that are behind the scenes. You may not see them. So what uh, you show there, there's a boat owner. He has to buy the boat and make mm-hmm. sure that the slip is paid. Then you have the mechanic who's going to check it. You've got the bait guys. You've got the guy that brings the drinks to the dock in the morning. The man that makes your fishing licenses. There's the whole crowd of people there that people are unaware of. Mm-hmm. So people always tend to think, the issue that we have here in Mexico is that they do not see sports fishing as an industry. Oh, wow. They That's... see it more as a um, something for rich people. Oh, wow. And then you're not seeing all these faces behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. 
So I think we have actually 13 people there. And if you put an average of four people per family, some are more, some are less, let's do an average, that's 52 people mm -hmm. that depend on that boat going out every day wow. for their livelihood. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, hugely important industry for us, which is why we've done a lot more now with um, conservation, yeah. even on, uh, on multi-species. So we're tagging now roosterfish, we're tagging tuna, dorado. One of the coolest stories is we've been working with Grey Fish Tag, who you know is a sponsor of the Jackpot Tuna Tournament from Western Outdoor News. Mm -hmm. They've been an incredible partner for us because their tagging program embraces charter boat captains. You know, um, people, when they think charter boat, if they don't know Cabo, they may have a misguided idea of what a charter boat is. Um, they're thinking a junky old boat, and that's not the case. The level of the boats here and of the crews is extremely high. So they get the tags for free into charter boat captains' hands. What is the success of a chart of a tagging program? How many tags you get back? So there's a lot of other tagging programs around, but you rarely hear of a recapture. In this program, they're putting thousands of tags a year for free into the professionals' hands that are out there every day. Wow. So we've had incredible amounts of um, recoveries. For the tags. For, for the, the tags, tags. Yeah. yeah. And we're learning so much. And all their information they share openly on their website. Wow. Um, one of the coolest stories was we tagged a straight marlin here on the Pacific on uh, one of our boats. I believe it was the Rebecca or the Tracy Ann. And they tagged it in September of uh, 2019, and the fish was recaptured in March of 2020. Wow. Where do you think it was re recaptured? Same spot. <laughs> what do you think? I would say not even close to the same spot. <laughs> Very far away. I was extremely shocked. It was called at Coco's Island, Costa Rica. No way. Yeah. Wow. So no one knows that. Now we know this. Oh wow! Unfortunately, a lot That's of the a lot, a lot of the fish that we have tagged have ended up on a on commercial long line boats on the dock in Mazatlan. No. But at least we know where they're going. So, mm -hmm. what we need is all this information to be able to protect our fishery because you can say whatever you want. You want to have numbers and facts and figures. So we also work hand in hand with a lot of the scientists here and marine biologists. We give them our data on a daily basis. We mm -hmm. share it. So they can track exactly what's happening. We have records going back to the eighties that tell us where, when, how, who. Mm -hmm. You know, and all that kind of size. So the fishery here, there's a lot more pressure on it now. Um, the COVID thing's actually been good for fishing. I was going to ask that. Yeah. So there was a shutdown here in Cabo. How long did that last? Uh, we were completely shut down for two months. Two from months. From March to June. So no, not a single sport fishing boat or was it even? No uh, boats. No boats going out No boats out of the could harbor. go out. The boats were sitting at the docks. Two so months. two months. That, I mean, that's a, that means a lot of March, fish. April, May, June. Three months. Sorry. <laughs> wow. So yeah, even more. Three months yeah. to to let the population kind of be basically untouched for three months has to have a huge impact. Well, we're still seeing it now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the amount of bait just right here in the Bay of Cabo yesterday when you're out on the boat. Yeah. Um, the one that I see the biggest rebound in is Dorado. I've not seen these numbers of Dorado in 10 years. I see a lot of yellow flags on yeah. <laughs> coming into the but harbor. For years, the last 10 years, and it's not the sports fishing. The sports fishing, there's more pressure on the fish through the sports fishing, but commercial fishing is really the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're, if you're aware or not, but the species of um, marlin, sailfish, swordfish, Dorado, roosterfish, and one other that we don't get here, are reserved only for sports fishing in Mexico. They are not commercial species. So you're not allowed to catch these fish commercially with, you know, within 10 miles of the shore. It goes by the size of the boat. So boats up to 27 feet have to be 10 miles offshore. Then up to 72 feet, they have to be 15 miles offshore. And then larger than that, they have to be like 50 miles offshore. So, um, but they do allow them to fish for shark within those limits. And oh. then they say it's bycatch, bycatch and they're catching a ton of, of marlin, you know. But if you went to Mag Bay or something, you'd be blown away because there's so many fish up there. People are releasing 80 to 100 marlin in a day up there. Wow. So, Good thing they're releasing is yeah, the important word there. Exactly. And, you know, there's limits as to what you can bring on board. Mm -hmm. So overall, I think um, the Cabo fishery is still pretty healthy. We need to educate people more. And that's the crews and the anglers to have a little bit more of a, you know, a long-term vision. Because it's much more sustainable if you can release a fish and then the people can come back and, you know, catch that same fish or 
the next year all the fish has been able to reproduce mm -hmm. rather than just take it, kill the fish for meat and get a few pesos on the, on the dollar for it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So keeping it available for generations to come exactly. is obviously a, a big, a big mm -hmm. plus to that. Uh, how can our listeners get in touch with Pisces and book a trip down here to Cabo? Okay, well, pretty easy. You can um, go onto our website, www.piscesportsfishing.com. We have a live chat feature on this. So you can ask questions right there. And then we just launched our new website. If you haven't seen it, please go in and take a look. It's pretty cool. And uh, we also have an 800 number, which I'm going to give to you right now. I don't have it to hand the second. In fact, I could talk for another hour. I was just barely getting warmed up, guys. So <laughs> We only got into the standard boats. We didn't talk about all the really beautiful Vikings that we have in the fleet now. Well, let, it, let, it, let it rip. Let's hear it. You so. know, so we've got the, the standard boats. We have the um, mid-range boats, which are blackfins, cabos, some smaller Vikings. And we have some really top-of-the-range Viking sports fishers which you cannot charter those anywhere in the world. There's very few places, if any, where you can go and charter a 2021 model boat, mm -hmm. which we have right now. We have three or four of them. We have a 46-foot billfish. We have a 48-foot uh, convertible coming in. We have a 58-foot um, Viking that you saw out there this morning. Beautiful blue boat. Beautiful. So we have something for everybody's budget and taste, from pangas all the way up to um, mega yachts, because we now we have a yacht division too. <laughs> Yeah, I saw some of those out there. They're pretty, uh, they're pretty awe-inspiring to see <laughs> to see them come out of the harbor here. It's pretty cool, no? So yeah, yeah, give us a give us go to our website www.piscesportsfishing.com or visit our group of companies, which is www.piscesgroupcabo.com. Or we also have a toll-free number, which is one eight seven seven two six six seven nine three eight. Thanks again to Tracy Ehrenberg. I feel like we could have talked to her forever. She has so many incredible stories. Uh, but thank you guys so much for sticking around until the absolute end here. I just wanted to add one more thing. So we have a email address, and it's podcast at wonews.com. If you have any questions, comments, or trip reports, you can call our voicemail number at 702 850 4966 or send an email to podcast at wonews.com. Thanks again. We will see you next week here at the Western Outdoor News Podcast. Mm -hmm.